The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. I saw a pale horse, the beast. We're told in the book of Revelation. This is not a human child. Isn't that an angel? Satan. Armageddon is almost upon us. Order the use of nuclear weapons. The world is a fine place and worth fighting for. Here. Welcome to the end of the world. Wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. This is P.I.T. Radio. From the beautiful Missouri Ozarks, greetings and welcome. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert. Oh, let me get my mic uh, over here by my face. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to PID Radio. <laughs> we're so glad you've chosen to join us in our humble bunker today. Uh, we're, you know what? It's beautiful weather. It is beautiful weather. Yeah, we're talking mid sixties here in the Ozarks. A week after we and were that's single not digit, just my age. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's been a real up and down week weather-wise. We had uh, negative Fahrenheit temperatures, which uh, if you're in Celsius land, it's like minus, what, 19 or something ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, we were down about minus two, minus three earlier this week. Today's 65, and we're expecting some thunderstorms later this afternoon. Yay! So springtime has arrived already. I'll take it. I'll be yeah. happy to have a, a, you know, honestly, early spring will make me very, very happy. So if the groundhog that has been hanging out by our house for the last year or so decides to show up and says, hey, let's go. We're, we're ready to go. We're ready to yeah. go. We're ready to go. Well, uh, he, I'm hoping he won't be back. I mean, he was kind of cute running across the driveway that one time. He but will he was... probably be back if he can figure out a way to find a big enough hole to hang out. Yeah. He, he will. He will. Do you remember, though, when we lived in Indiana, this little town, Shelbyville, Indiana, mm-hmm. that was uh, outside of Indianapolis? Great little town. Mm-hmm. Loved living there. Yep. Walk in the backyard when we lived on Van Avenue, and there is the groundhog. Oh, that's right. Sam spotted him and was not happy. And the groundhog came around the corner of the our garage and just looked at Sam like, what? Yeah. There was no there was no dog here last time I visited. Yeah, and Sam ran him off. Yes. So uh, Sam ran off everything and anyone who got in his neighbor way. Neighbor dog that weighed about eighty pounds. Sam ran it off. Uh, dog was like ran, ran a block and then stopped and turned around like, what just happened? <laughs> he he looked like he he was actually more than eighty pounds. I think he looked like a small Irish wolfhound. This mm-hmm. dog, he, yeah, he was all shaggy and had that sort of look to him. And just he a just friendly turned, dog. Yeah. He was very friendly, and he just turned around and looked like what? What? <laughs> what <laughs> but, just um, happened to me? When Sam defends his turf, he's uh, yeah, he's he's fearless. He's pretty scary. He's, it's like these these teeth that grow <laughs> the, from normal teeth to like four inches long. Yeah. It's it's like watching the snout on a on a great white shark. Shark Week on on uh, the, on TV when oh. that snout comes back at Dachshund NATO. Oh, oh. <gasps> yeah. You will never survive Dachshund NATO. That's it. We've got the next great mockbuster for uh, Sci Fi Channel. <laughs> Um, and, yeah, in fact, even the coyotes were talking to Sam last night. They were paying homage last night about eleven o'clock as they ran past the front of the house. I think they were on the other side of the highway, but they sounded really they close. They sounded like but, they were um, in our front yard. In fact, you got up and you were looking out the window yeah. like, wait a minute, we don't hear those in Chicago. It, yeah, exactly. Um, couldn't see them because we've got the fence between here and there, but... Uh, they were partying. I think it, one it of them was getting like married. They were having, you know, a stag night. I've, yeah, it yeah, sounds like some, back in my younger days, <laughs> nights out with the boys. Yup, 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 yup. Yeah. <laughs> Oh well. oh, well, well, a lot going on, uh, not not in Washington, D.C., but that's not necessarily a bad thing. I, I say that tongue in cheek. Uh, the government technically shut down with the uh, uh, the lack of funding, you know, the lack of a funding deal. When is the, uh, uh, is it today that he gives the, uh, um, uh, oh, what am I trying State to say? State of the, State of the Union? Union? Is it today? Mm, don't think so. That's a good question, though. It usually is around this time of year, isn't it? Yep. Uh, so we'll we'll look that up. But um, you know, ha- having said that, you know, bec- uh, okay, Tuesday, January thirtieth. Oh, okay. Will be the twenty eighteen State of the Union. Well, I thought it'd be really, really interesting this time around, shouldn't it? <laughs> That's what I think uh, too. So a week from this Tuesday, as we record this on the twenty first of January. We're really sorry. There's no electricity in the the, the house today. Yeah, We'd exactly. love to have you, but sorry. We just feel sick about it. 
But some friends of ours who've got people who depend on government paychecks are not, um, uh, you know, they, they are affected. And the United States government is a huge employer. So, you know, this is, there are real people who are being affected by this. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to get into all the politics of this because frankly, a lot of this is just being done for show. In fact, I think some of this right now is to detract from the memo that the House Intelligence Committee has written up. This is something that is not getting the kind of attention that it would if it were a Republican administration that had done this. I mean, when Richard Nixon um, authorized, or at least gave a nod and a wink, to sending a couple of, um, what do they call it, third-rate burglars, or it was described as a third-rate burglary mm-hmm. later on. Something like that, yeah. To Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate Hotel, it became the uh, the name for every government scandal, every scandal ever since 1971 or whenever the Watergate break-in took place. Mm-hmm. Um, that, and you, and in fact, young people don't even know what the Watergate Hotel was. They, they just don't. Think, in fact, they think gate is something that's automatically appended uh, yeah. to anything that's happening. So exactly. Watergate gate is what they sometimes refer to. Exactly. It as. Yeah. Well, that was Watergate gate. Like, no, you uh. <laughs> young punk. But if this, but because this happened during the Obama administration, the uh, media is more or less giving this a pass. Basically, what happened? I've been kind of watching this, and there's a really good uh, conservative blog site that does some really in-depth analysis, and I give them credit for this. It's called the uh, the Last Refuge. Mm-hmm. Uh, the website is, and I'll put a link to this in the notes because you really ought to add this to your your regular reading list. Uh, the Last Refuge website is uh, theconservativetreehouse.com. dot com. Yes, it's, Which a, it's a great place. Kind of silly, but the you know the last refuge is the uh, the site, and they've been looking at this for a long time. And basically, what com- what what happened was this, uh, in a nutshell. I mean, it's it's pretty convoluted, but in a nutshell, the the uh, Steele dossier, Christopher Steele, the former MI6 operative who was contracted by Fusion GPS, which is a company that hires itself out to do opposition research for political parties. Mm-hmm. And a lot mainly for of Democrats money to be made right. during elections, because uh, the founder was a uh, former Associated Press reporter, Glenn Simpson, uh, and most, let's face it, most news reporters, most people in media today, over ninety percent self-identify as Democrats. Less than ten percent of the of the people in media in the United States that identify as Republicans. Mm-hmm. So, they were hired by the the Hillary Clinton campaign to dig up dirt on Donald Trump, and. Fusion GPS hired Christopher Steele. What Steele pulled together was that dossier full of salacious untruths, which was then presented to the FBI, which the FBI then used to get a FISA court to approve surveillance on the Trump campaign. Mm -hmm. Now, that's bad enough, but it it appears that um, they're now trying to cover their tracks and... Hmm. You hear cars honking. Somebody's out. happy. The yeah. car's happy. Well, hello to you too. Um, it, 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 it's what, what it comes down to is this. The intelligence community of the United States was weaponized against the Trump administration, against the Trump campaign, because mm-hmm. this took place in 2016 when Trump was still running for, for president, yes. when it became clear that he was going to be uh, the candidate. Um, so, so understand what that means. One political party, the party that currently held the White House, used America's intelligence community, the FBI, the CIA, and the NSA, to spy on the opposition party. Yes. And one particular it's way candidate. way bigger this than Watergate. This is way bigger than Watergate. There was a few Watergate. plumbers that broke into a, a, a Dr. El, El, no, not Ellsberg. But no, the uh, Watergate Hotel, Democratic National Committee headquarters. But there was also another one where they broke in elsewhere. Um, that I, it was I a psychiatrist's office. Oh, looking for information to discredit Daniel mm-hmm. Ellsberg? Mm-hmm. Okay, that that's something else. Okay, sorry. But I, Carry on. I, I think, now I could be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure what they were trying to do was just break into DNC headquarters to try to get dirt on uh, what the Democrats were trying to do. Um, this goes way beyond that, because again, it, it used the power of the, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Central Intelligence Agency, and the National Security Agency for political purposes. This... I mean, you know, think about that. This is way scarier than Vladimir Putin. Our own government turning 
the entire power of the federal government's uh, uh, surveillance capabilities on a guy that they didn't want to become president of the United States. That's yeah. not supposed to be the, that's not the United States, at least not, that's not the United States I signed up for. No, that's true. No. Um, sorry, I'm reading something else where you're saying that, trying to follow up on the Ellsberg thing. Okay. So anyway, um, the uh, House Intelligence Committee, led by uh, Chairman Devin Nunez, who's a Republican uh, congressman from California, wrote this four-page memo summarizing how, uh, what are called um, 702 requests, were uh, were essentially weaponized. I think that's correct. 702 requests. There there are a t- couple of types of um, the, these requests that are um, used by the NSA to uh, um, get information, metadata from, mm-hmm. from uh, communications intercepts. One is uh, to from information and another is about information. So the to from information is just who did it come from, who did it go to, but the about information pulls all the metadata. Um, and the uh, commander, the the uh, the head of the NSA, director of the NSA, uh, Admiral um, Mike Rogers, I believe is. Uh, boy, I should have really pulled all this information together and had all this at top of mind. Um, I believe it's Mike Rogers. Uh, he realized what was going on. Yeah, Mike Rogers when he started seeing a lot of unauthorized or unusual number of 702 requests coming through and realized what was going on um, and essentially went to the FISA court and put a stop to it. And then once he realized that uh, the Trump campaign had been surveilled uh, the, the day after the election, he made a trip to New York to Trump tower where um, the Trump transition team was beginning to work Mm-hmm. And he traveled to New York to, we think, I say we think, um, the the analysts at uh, the Last Refuge think it was to brief Donald Trump and his team on what was going on, saying basically, you're being spied on by the CIA and or the NSA. And and what what was really egregious about this is that the FBI was allowing a contractor probably fusion GPS to go through this intelligence stuff that was being collected by the NSA. Mm-hmm. So a private company was being given access to information being collected by the national security agency on American citizens, which is not supposed to happen at all. The day after Rogers went there without telling his boss, who was the director of national intelligence, uh, James Clapper, um, which really ticked him off because the day after that, apparently Clapper and a couple of other high ups in the Obama administration started calling for Rogers to be fired. Trump and his team suddenly packed up shop from Trump Towers and moved to one of his uh, I think ah. golf courses. They moved. Yeah. So that smart. would suggest that uh, NSA Director Rogers, who was uh, aghast at how the apparatus had been misused, went and told Donald Trump before they started, you know, interviewing candidates for uh, cabinet positions and mm-hmm. stuff. Again, this is the kind of thing that's not supposed to happen. We are not supposed to be under surveillance by the National Security Agency. The NSA is only supposed to uh, collect information on American citizens if they're in contact with foreigners that we think are a national security threat, and then only if they get a FISA court to sign off on it. Right. But apparently what's happened is, again, this ginned up um, phony dossier was used, paid for by the Clinton campaign and the DNC. And that's not, you know, this conservative website making this up. The Washington Post reported this. Uh, That was what was used to get the FISA court to authorize the surveillance of the Trump campaign. And the memo has not been released to the public, but there are those congressmen who say that they have seen it. Right. And are furious about it. So there are enough calls out there that um, that this be released to the public so the public see it, that that may be why the Democrats are holding up the government so that everybody's paying attention to the government shutdown instead of what might be in this explosive memo. Well, that now, could be. And if, and if some of the congressmen and women have seen it, then I'm sorry, you cannot make that go away. Right. Um, and, and But here's the thing. Uh, Republicans, if they want to release this, they really could because, and I've read that uh, the Intelligence Committee will vote. Yes, it is going to vote on whether or not to release it. And since there are a majority of Republicans on the committee, if they vote straight party line, it'll yeah. be released. Yeah. So, but you know, if Donald Trump wants to release it, he can declassify yes, anything he, he wants. 
So the Republicans could release this. So let's not get caught up in the politics of this. I'm curious to see what's in there. I've got a pretty good idea because I've been reading The Last Refuge, and I Mm -hmm. think they've nailed it uh, because their analysis fits the evidence. Mm -hmm. So uh, we we shall see. But this, assuming that their analysis is correct— that the intelligence community of the United States was weaponized against for the use of one party against another in a political campaign. That's the kind of thing that we grew up thinking only happened in places like Russia and China. Ah, yeah. Well, that's true. This is a bigger deal than Watergate. And for those who are sitting there thinking, did she ever find out how Hmm. Daniel Ellsberg fits into Watergate? He does. Ah, okay. Because he wrote the Pentagon papers and that or revealed, published the Pentagon Papers. He well, got right. Published, he published them, exactly. He right. published all of these papers he discovered um, that reveal machinations behind the Vietnam War. Mm-hmm. And here's what I find most interesting about this, because he was going after the Johnson administration, mm-hmm. a de- Democratic organization. The ah, Nixon ah. White House. Right, right. The Nixon White House was trying to shut it down. Gotcha, gotcha. And it was because Ellsberg was trying to show that he was trying to be silenced that the White House plumbers Uh were revealed and their activities at the Watergate Hotel. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Well, very good. I mean, you've got a better memory. Of course, I grew up then. I, I wasn't even 10 years old when that stuff was going on. So, but I did interview Daniel Ellsberg once. I know you did. And that's yeah, one of the reasons yeah. I wanted to bring him in. Uh, here's the thing. Ellsberg was initially charged with conspiracy, espionage, and theft of government property. We've seen a lot of that lately. Mm-hmm. But the charges were later dismissed after prosecutors investigating the Watergate scandal discovered that staff members in the Nixon White House had ordered the so-called White House plumbers Mm -hmm. to engage in unlawful acts to discredit Ellsberg. They broke broke into his psychiatrist's office. Right, right. Trying to get information on him to say, oh, Mm -hmm. don't listen to Ellsberg. He's crazy. Yeah, 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 pretty much. Yeah. So that's that's the scoop there. So my brain wasn't totally faulty. No. Okay. Well, that, that and that's an interesting bit of information because it shows that there is a political class in Washington D.C. that protects its own. Now there is apparently- that is outside of of party lines. Yes, yes, and apparently there's at least one Republican. I don't know if he's on the uh, intelligence committee or not, but at least one Republican who said, "No, no, no, national security. We shouldn't release this." Yeah, well, I've seen that hmm. too. Mm, yeah, we shall see. Is that the same um, one who said, "I was shocked, shocked"? I tell you, <laughs> I'd give it to you, but. There's so much in there that is going to, it's dangerous, so I can't show it to you. Yeah, yeah. Well, both sides are going to, let's let's be honest, both major parties are going to play this for um, ma- ma- for, for political gain. I, I do think Devin Nunez has been doing a good job in a really difficult situation because he does have to balance national security considerations with the, the privacies that we're supposed to, the privacy that we're supposed to be guaranteed by the Constitution. Mm-hmm. I mean, the Constitution is supposed to protect us against unlawful search and seizure. And the unlawful search is, you know, that part of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, that says the government has to go to a court and get a judge to issue a warrant. Yes. And to get the warrant, they have to tell the judge why they want to search through your stuff and what they hope to find. And what, uh, you know, we're, we're living in a world now where the government says, no, no, in today's nine, post-9-11 world, and because of electronic communications, we mm-hmm. can't wait for that kind of authorization. And the FISA uh, court, it, it almost, sunsets every six months or so, and they yeah. always re-up it. And with, so I think recently they changed the language. They reapproved it, but they said, oh, you can't get, you know, you can't just do blanket uh, stuff mm-hmm. unless. And there's always this unless. Right, right. And it's any kind of a, a vague unless, you know, national security is at risk, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Well. National security was at risk. You just want to spy on your ex-wife, yes, but I think she's spying on for, for the Russians. For the Russians. Yeah. Well, what they really need is this British teen hacker who managed to pose. He broke yeah, yeah. into the CIA and FBI databases. He posed to this as the CIA boss. Mm-hmm. And managed to access all sorts of secret military files. He got the uh, uh, home addresses of people who were involved in. The Ferguson, Missouri campaign. Oh, interesting. the officer who was being charged. He it's listed as the best breach ever, according to this hacker. Uh-huh. He's bragging about what he did, but at the same time, 
that he's bragging about what he did and saying the reason he did it is because he's so sick of U.S. politics. He's saying he shouldn't be prosecuted because he's got autism. Asperger's? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. I didn't really know right from wrong. Um, That's what he's saying. I don't know right from wrong. Oh, please. Yeah. You just said you did it because of the U.S.'s policies. Mm-hmm. If you can't tell right from wrong, then then how do you know our our U.S. policies policies are bad? bad. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. So, Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, he apparently not only broke in and got information, but he was sending uh, threats, Mm -hmm. really specific, lewd, L E W D Mm -hmm. threats to the Homeland Security chief and his family. Yeah, Jay Johnson broke uh, into his wife's iPad. hmm. It's it's frightening that uh, people connected with the. intelligence and security apparatus in the United States government aren't protected you know, that a 17 year old kid in England can get into their, their personal, uh, get in and control at remote communications devices. Yeah. Um, he even sent uh, a swatting attack to yes. a science advisor to president Obama, John Holdren, who is uh, famous for saying that there are too many of us and we need to, you know, have fewer people or otherwise the earth will overheat, you know, <laughs> <laughs> breach hall, all die. Um, Malthusian. But- yeah, yeah. Um, but it's uh, – swatting attacks are, are horrible because there was a case recently where one of those went bad. A swatting attack is where you make a false report to police and say there's a hostage situation or something like that that requires mm-hmm. a SWAT team response. And, uh, you know, SWAT team response guys are, uh, you know, jacked up facing possible a, a possible uh, armed – Mm-hmm. Uh, confrontation and um, you know things can go really wrong in a hurry and that did happen in uh, a, a recent case and it, it and that was over uh, a video game dispute yes well apparently swatting is pretty common in video games uh, online gaming where they bad. think that we're just going to you're you're getting me on the field on the virtual field so i'm going to swat you Right, right. I'm going to call the police to your house, which will distract you long enough that I can take down your avatar in the game. And that may sound really petty and minor, but the fact is that some of these video games have rewards within Mm -hmm. the system that's more than just, hey, I beat the boss. Yeah. It's, I'm I'm mining for essentially virtual gold. Yeah, cryptocurrencies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you do a search search for swatting, S-W-A-T-T-I-N-G, um, Hmm. Over 4 million results and uh, several from what just within the last couple of days. That's crazy. That and, is crazy. Well, well, it is because it's it's dangerous. And uh, anyone who, you know, you talk about yelling fire in a crowded theater. This, you know, doesn't involve as many people, but it's got this, a similar potential for um, tragedy. Yeah. So. And the kids who are doing this are, uh, they are often really savvy with regards to coding. So they're able to spoof the address there or the phone call right, that, that's right. going into authority. So the authorities have no idea. They may think it's a next door neighbor who's making the call. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, oh, man. So anyway, yeah, it's, um, this, this British teen hacker, um, <laughs> Posing as the head of the CIA and got access to military files that way. Yeah. That's, that's not a, that's not a uh, that's not a good thing. No, it's not. Well, speaking of hacking, we need to discuss uh, Triton, which we talked about on Sci Friday. But yeah. Triton, also called Trisis, T R I S I S, it's a malware uh, virus that apparently hackers, probably state sponsored hackers, mm-hmm. in other words, a country did this, um, managed to break into the uh, uh, it, it's the control system for Schneider Electronics um, I don't know what exactly what it is it's, if it's a program or if it's actually hardware that runs inside these plants but the the break-in happened in what did it happen in August happened last year mm-hmm. in Saudi Arabia I have never found the name of the plant listed. It just says a plant yeah. in Saudi Arabia. So it's probably gas or electric, but it could be you know, something else. But right. some sort of a plant that runs Snyder Electronics, and the, Snyder Electrics, I mean, and this system is intended to keep the uh, um, sort of the homeostasis within the, the plant itself to make sure that everything runs the, the proper temperatures, things like that. Mm-hmm. Well, if it's a certain kind of plant, as in nuclear, you want things to run efficiently at the correct temperature. Right. And apparently this hacker gained remote control, put the payload in. So it wasn't, this person was not physically in the building. Mm-hmm. 
He or she gained remote control just like this hacker did and managed to do this damage so much so that this redundant system said, I'm really confused. I'm getting all of these various signals. This code's being rewritten. It's not being rewritten over here. I'm shutting everything down. Mm -hmm. This, again, this was at a plant somewhere in Saudi Arabia, a an oil and gas facility. Oh, it did say that? Yeah. It was um, – this Schneider Electric system called Triconnex is supposed to be a triple redundant safety system inside the plant. And if it fails, then, uh, as you say, it, it can lead to a, a catastrophic uh, result. Um well, the this, thinking is that this. First of all, the thinking is that this was Iran. Well, that did it, but but that's that was early, early speculation back in December, right? Um, the the way this got into the wild, apparently, somebody at Schneider Electric uploaded this to a security site to get some information about the um, the this piece of malware. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was taken it was, down within twenty four hours. Yeah, they posted it to a, a website called Virus Total to uh, get. It's security vendors on the case. You know, mm-hmm. what, what is this thing that's shut down this plant? It's it's compromised our systems and this plant in Saudi Arabia or somewhere in the Middle East has, has gone offline, uh, probably Saudi Arabia. Mm-hmm. And Well, I've, I saw that it was Saudi Arabia. Okay. I've seen that at Confirmed. three different okay. sites. And shortly thereafter, a third party contacted Schneider saying, please take this down, get this offline. But too late, it had already been uh, downloaded and then uploaded to GitHub, which is a website for open source software mm-hmm. collaboration. Yes. So other developers can now access it, download it, modify it, and use it. That's called getting into the wild, as you said, which means that we have no idea who yeah. has this now. Yep. And according to uh, information security specialists, this likely was likely created by a nation state. So it's not some 17-year-old kid working at home. Um, this may have been... Um, Iran trying to target Saudi Arabia. On the other hand, uh, there's some speculation that it might have been North Korean hackers. Mm -hmm. So, um, Also, if you wanted to play the blame game, you could make it look like it was Iran doing it. Right. Because you can spoof that. Well, and that's one of the... It's like swatting. (laughs) Exactly. That's one of the things with the... uh, One of the aspects of the alleged Russian hacking of Democratic National Committee email that... You know, people on the left don't want to hear. It's well, they found Russian. You know, the fingerprints of Russian hackers in. It's like, look, if that was a Russian government hacker, they wouldn't have left. You know, Cyrillic code. Exactly. <laughs> you practically signed it. Putin it, was exa- here. Exactly. I mean, they, come on, they're better than that. All right. This was somebody trying to make it look like Russians had done it. Yes. Um, and based on the speed, there was an uh, analysis done of uh, based on timestamps of, um, and, and I. Don't know the particulars, but essentially by analyzing time stamps of what was downloaded and when from the servers, that it was downloaded so quickly it had to be downloaded via USB 3.0 mm-hmm. port onto a thumb drive. So however those – somebody inside – in other words, someone inside the DNC downloaded, downloaded those emails and then gave them to WikiLeaks. Yes. It was not Russia. Yes. So, but you know that, that doesn't play well, the narrative, and uh, la, 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 Putin did it. Stop telling me things that I don't like to Stop hear. Stop facts. I don't, I, I don't like I them. I want my safe space. <laughs> reality is what I make it. Oh, you know, speaking of reality, this there are times that you see stories and you think, what are you thinking? <laughs> Apparently, a TV crew tried to get a fake bomb through a Newark airport security uh, checkpoint. Yes. CNBC. Mm-hmm. They didn't make it. They got caught. No, they they did get caught, and I'm glad that they did. They were carrying an improvised explosive device, according to the TSA. It looks to me like it's a piece of, they're, they're saying it's a piece of a vacuum cleaner. It kind of looks like a drill, <laughs> you know, a corded drill in the mm-hmm. suitcase and some other stuff. It is. It's a corded drill. I'm looking right at it. <clears throat> And there may be some hosing or whatever from a vacuum cleaner, but the the fact is that it was a fake bomb. And it's apparently for a show called Staten Island Hustle. Okay. So Endemol Shine North America is the production company, and it was trying to pull a fast one and have it go on its show and become, you know, famous. Mm. I don't know. Idgets. 
Well, I'm glad I wasn't on that plane. I'm also glad I wasn't on a plane that flew out of uh, Gatwick Airport this morning. The uh, pilot is reported to have been quite inebriated, and oh. he was taken off by by uh, 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 officials, mm-hmm. law enforcement officials, and uh, I'm, you know he was he was going to pilot an 11 hour flight from Gatwick, London, to Mauritius. Well, you know that's. One of the incidents that developers of uh, auto, I mean, we've already got autopilots to handle planes in the air during the long, boring part between airports. Yeah. Um, but we're going we're gonna to hear stories like that as justification for letting automated systems take over and uh, pilot the planes from takeoff to landing. I was and, just thinking we're going to have Uber for flying. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yes, can you pick me up over here at my corner? I'm on the corner of... Uh, <laughs> Well, that, that probably this is coming. The drone comes and picks you up and right. takes you to the big drone that, you know, then autopilots you over to your, and drops you off. Sort of like a drone rickshaw. Sort of. Yeah. Uh, no, that's probably coming. That huh? probably is coming. Yeah, I think so too. And and I don't think it's that far off. 50 years off, maybe, if mm, that. Yeah, if that. So it's, um, and certainly we're going to, and we talked about this before, we're, we're going to see driverless vehicles on the roads. They're well, already they're testing. Already, yeah. We're, we're already seeing it with with cabs, but uh, I think it's really going to be over the road truckers that are going to be over the road trucks are going to be the ones that really use the yes. uh, driverless uh, feature first. But Was it the Infinity anything- though that the story came out a couple of a couple of days ago, and I think beginning in twenty nineteen, there are no steering wheels on there in the. Oh, Infinity? so there's no so there's no option to even take over and go to manual. Right. Well, that's just stupid. Yeah, that's, I, I that's know. That's just stupid. I know, but Even I Even for not, maintenance purposes, you want, okay, look. We, we, what could possibly go wrong? Yeah. Look, in order to have a car that is so flawlessly self-driving, you would have to have every car on the highway interconnected. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's really the, and I put this in air quotes, safest way to do it. Hmm. But if you interconnect everything, then everything suddenly does become hackable. Exactly right. Including your car. Right, exactly. And there, there are, uh, there's been proof of concept of that already, where hackers have shown, yeah, we can get in through the entertainment system and take over. How it, entertaining is that? Yeah. They, well, they're entertained by it, clearly. Well, it'd be great if you're watching it on a movie screen and not in the car itself. I think in the car itself, it would be... Uh, Mm, yeah. Yeah. Not not so good. No. Uh, change, and in fact, here's the thing. Change of underpants if, time. <laughs> if your car is hacked and suddenly is turned into a weapon, essentially, are the other cars that are talking to you, do they realize that it's been hacked? And either everybody shuts down mm-hmm. or the other cars, which are armed and ready, <laughs> <laughs> go into self-defense mode. <laughs> and start blasting away, yeah. <laughs> the, the hapless humans on the inside are beating on the windshields. Get us out! Out of here. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like um, premise for uh, one of Philip K. Dick's Electric Dreams I know, episodes. Which or, is a, uh, honestly, it, there are a couple of episodes that are a little, well, maybe adults only, but <clears throat> it's it's a really good series. Derek and I binge watched it last weekend. Mm-hmm. Good uh, stuff in terms of uh, where, where every episode has. Uh, kind of like Black Mirror was organized around the uh, dystopian future that technology might lead us to. Um, Philip K. Dick's Electric Dreams, which is, uh, I think, an, uh, is that an Amazon Prime original or is that Netflix original? Mm, one, one or the other. Prime. Okay, Amazon Prime. Um, based on his short stories, but all of them seem to revolve around what it means to be human. Yeah. The, con- the, the question, what it means to be human. Yeah. So, well, um, he's the one who wrote Blade Runner. Right. Well, wrote the, the short story the Blade Runner was turned into. Yes, do, elect, do Androids Dream, Dream of, of Electric, Electric Sheep. Sheep was the short story. So really creative stuff. But yeah, it does sound like uh, one of those episodes. What happens if... Uh, w- w- I thought the most disturbing episode, and one that, uh, well, all of this, th- these revelations coming out about the FISA court abuses around the Trump campaign... Uh, reminded me of, which is mm-hmm. the uh, episode called KAO, which stands yes. for Kill All, all others. others. And what Chilling happens in a, message. Yeah, in a total surveillance state, which we Americans, whether we like it or not, are now living in. Yeah. You know, another thing I liked about that series, and I think that's why many of our listeners are going to relate to it better. It, it Sometimes these series that are uh, 
technologically dystopian, uh, tend to want to appeal to the millennials and younger. So mm-hmm. they're going for really young, hip looking, you know, actors. This team, they, they were more every people, you know, uh, mm-hmm. uh, people that are look like they're in their 40s or 50s. Yeah. That are trying to deal with the changes. Not model gorgeous. Right. I mean, Steve Buscemi in that KAO episode, uh, actor, character actor named uh, Mel Rodriguez. Oh, was he's wonderful. so good in that. Yeah, kind of a, you know, big uh, guy, you know, just a... Yeah. Uh, and it was smart because you're going to relate better to right. that kind of actor than than to you know a Kendall, super cute Kendall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, well, uh, boy, a couple I, a couple of things. I was going to say go the ahead. next one I've got coming up. You've probably already talked about this. People in California paying nine dollars a gallon for Oregon tap water because it's raw water. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I actually haven't talked about that, but I was thinking about that and thinking, boy, how do we get a cut of that? Because we drink raw water. We here. do. It's it's just our well water. So gonna it's have some treat. right now. In hey, fact, it's mm. delicious water. Mm. But honestly, that's what I grew up on was well water, and well water has a lot of really great minerals and things in mm-hmm. it. It's not been treated to death. It doesn't have death in it. Yeah. Um, now, yeah, you need to make sure you need to have it tested. Right. We have it tested every year, and uh, but but other than that, it's good stuff. Yeah, we we are blessed in that we uh, are living in an area where the water is. Coming from far below ground, our, our well goes down, I think, 300, well, it goes down about 600 feet, but it doesn't hit water till about 325, I yeah. think. So, um, yeah, we uh, are, are blessed. Not everybody lives in a place where they can drink the kind of water that we drink. But, right. boy, I grew up drinking Chicago City water. And mm-hmm. when, yeah, we'd go visit my grandparents in North Dakota where they'd have well, you know, water out of a well. And that, to me, was like, bah. Oh, really? Well, because I was so used to drinking the chlorinated stuff out of Chicago. Oh, you know, from, good from Lake Michigan. So, you know, you, you get used to one thing and then suddenly you, it's something else. It, it just, it was to me. I was, guess, I guess. I got it. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, this is what we've got here. We are, we are truly blessed. This, this is, is really, really delicious but yeah, water. But yeah, some enterprising entre- entrepreneur uh, selling Los Angelinos and other Californians $9 a gallon for that water. The fact that it's Oregon tap water means it's, it, it just cracks <laughs> yes, me I up. Know. I know. Uh, that is a hoot. Well, speaking of California, there's a new movement out there to um, divide the state. And, uh, and and basically, the, a couple of guys are leading a movement to, uh, to get this, the, the rural counties in California, the high desert and those areas, um, to secede from the coastal regions and create new California. Much like Illinois wants to uh, secede from Chicago. Everything south of I-80 would like, mm. love to secede from Illinois, from, from Chicago. Yeah, exactly. Um there was a, a campaign in 2016, you might remember, where um, liberals wanted to split California into six states so they get more votes in Congress, more, re- you know, more more senators, basically, mm-hmm. as, a, as a response to Donald Trump and, and the rise of the, the alt-right. This is the other, going the other direction. Uh, people, uh, who are the, the coordinators? Uh, fellows named um, Preston and Reed are the last names of these fellows. Uh, anyway, they are wanting to take rural California. Robert Paul Preston and Tom Reed are the two guys behind mm-hmm. this. And basically tell the the uh you know the, the the urban areas from San Francisco down through San Diego to just go pound sand. Mm-hmm. Um literally and, sand. Yeah. Uh and I can see why because they're being legislated uh, and and regulated to death. California now, this surprised me. Uh, because of the natural resources in California, it is, um, you know, the, a lot of fruit, a lot of vegetables grown there, a lot of nuts. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I mean that in the sense of stuff that comes off trees, uh-huh. you know. Uh, they've got a lot of the other kind too, but uh, l- let's be kind. But combine that with some of the high-tech industries there. I mean, uh, Lockheed Martin Skunk Works is there for one thing. And of course, mm-hmm. Hollywood, which generates a lot of money. Television industry, uh, Silicon movie, Valley. Silicon Valley is there. So there's a lot of industry, but also a lot of agriculture in California. It should be the one of the, if not the wealthiest state, state in, the, in the nation. Yes, and it yet should be. It is the highest poverty rate in America. And probably, you know, except for maybe Illinois, the highest debt. Um, yeah, I think Illinois is worse in terms of debt, but the tax rate in California is higher than Illinois. I, I mean, this this is freaky because you'd think, okay, highest rate of poverty in the country. You're probably thinking one of the Southern states like Arkansas or Mississippi and no disrespect to either of those states. I've lived in Arkansas, loved it. But in fact, we can probably, we can almost see Arkansas from where we are now. So I'm, I'm not casting any I stones here. I think those here. coyotes were from Arkansas. Could Pretty be. sure. Could be. Uh, awfully friendly folks in Arkansas. Yes, they are. So um, that 
is not true. I mean, the fact is that uh, decades of blue state progressive policies in California have have raised the poverty level there. And now, uh, and, and this is just insanity, because the, the new tax policy, the tax plan that uh, the Repu- Republicans got through Congress is um, giving a lot of money back to wealthier people who tend to be owners of small businesses and so forth, who are suddenly reaping a tax windfall. I mean, Apple, Apple, yes. for Pete's sake, is, is bringing, what, a, a quarter of a trillion dollars? Yes, like back to our economy. Like billion that had been stashing offshore to shield it from taxes. It's bringing it back into the United States. It's going to pay a $38 billion repatriation fee. Okay, that's lower than the tax burden they would have had to pay if they'd done it before. But a lot of other business owners, small business owners, are going to benefit from this. So the assembly, which is the legislature in California, they want to pass a bill that would require business owners to turn over half of those tax savings to the state of California. Now, all right. Okay, if Apple is smart, they're going to fly their little UFO building Mm -hmm. out of that state. Exactly. Exactly. This is a fundamental misunderstanding of economics, and it's based on two faulty premises. First of all, that the business owners will just take the hit to their profit margins and just meekly turn over this money. Look, taxes are a cost of doing business. Mm -hmm. In order to stay in business, you have to make a profit. So what will happen if this bill actually is drafted and passes the legislature in California is that business owners will simply add their profit margin on top of the higher costs they would incur if California requires them to turn over, or shall we say confiscates, half of their tax savings. Meaning that the tax is would be paid by consumers in California. Yes, exactly. And not the business owners. And eventually, as is happening in Illinois, that the company, if they realize they simply cannot make a right. profit in that state, they will move. And that's point number two. This assumes that business owners are so happy to be in California that they'll just glad. Now, there are some businesses who depend on a certain clientele located in the, in the specific area. And I heard from business owners in Illinois, you know, machine shops and so forth, whose um, customers were located in around their shops. Sure. So, you know, we could move 20 miles east from Danville, Illinois, over the Indiana line, or I could move 20 miles west from Belleville, Illinois, over the Missouri line, but I'd be leaving all my customers behind. Okay, so they can't do that. But there are other customers like Apple, mm-hmm. whose cl- whose customers are all over the place. They don't need to be in California. Right. They could go to Texas or Florida or Tennessee or Missouri, someplace with a lower tax burden. And when you do a search on Google for businesses leaving California, you get something like 48 million, you know, return. So, yes, it is a thing. A lot of businesses are going to leave. California is... Well, again, I understand why these fellows are trying to form New California, and uh, the rest of us, 49 states, most of us anyway, are uh, in your corner. Well, you know, lest you think, uh, hear this story and you think that California would never break up into uh, multiple states, the United States has not always existed in the form in which we find it. No. You know, if you've been born in the last 30 or 40 years even, you may think, you may not realize that history is different than than the life that you have lived. There was actual history taking place before you were born. What? <laughs> I know. Just you and I just it was was it last night or this morning we were talking about six flags. Yeah, yeah. The I and I hadn't realized that for some reason I was under the mistaken impression that six flags and this makes no sense when you think about it. So I had a disconnect going on right there, but I, I thought it originated someplace where you could see six different states. Mm-hmm. And, and I can think of no place where you can actually see, unless you're in a plane, where you can see six different states. But you told me that the original one was in Texas, where you could, right. where they have, that area, Texas, has flown six different flags. Yeah, six nations have had sovereignty over some or all. All or some of Texas at some point in history. Spain, France, Mexico, the Republic of Texas, the USA, and then the Confederate States of America. Uh-huh. So, yeah. That's that's where Six Flags comes and from. And some people maybe go, France? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Believe it or not, France. Remember Maximilian? Huh. Yeah, that was... Um, actually, that was way before Maximilian. This was before uh, the Louisiana Purchase. Oh, but but wasn't Max? Wasn't that another French incursion into Mexico? Into Mexico, but Maximilian not in, not into and Texas. Carlotta. 
but not into Texas, though. Oh, I'm just, no, I'm not talking yeah. about Texas. I'm just saying that the French have been in the United States oh, yeah. not that long ago. Right. France um, controlled everything west of the Mississippi River from about 1684 until 1803 when mm-hmm. uh, Jefferson, you know, completed the Louisiana, the Louisiana Purchase. Louisiana Purchase. In fact, one of my ancestors, Reason Bailey, was uh, early, uh, claimed some land down around... Um, Cape Girardeau. There's a reason why Saint New Orleans... Ge- yeah, Cape Girardeau. No, is, St. Genevieve. St. Genevieve. Sorry. New Orleans is very French in character. Mm-hmm. In fact, if you look at pre-Civil War buildings in the South, a lot of them have French architecture. Mm-hmm. Madison, Indiana is proud to say that they have uh, tons of... Well, not tons. Well, actually, maybe tons. Lots of... Uh, of uh, uh, pre-Civil War houses mm-hmm. that were left over because there are a lot of areas that don't have any because of the war. <laughs> it destroyed right, right. them. Yeah. So Madison uh, has a lot of what they call antebellum or pre-war houses. Mm-hmm. And uh, many of the, much of the architecture looks a lot like New Orleans. Hmm. Which makes sense. There was a lot of uh, river traffic going down mm-hmm. the Ohio and then down the river and then coming back. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, in fact, another set of ancestors made that trip a couple of times to move um, grain and crops. That was that was a big thing. Um, farmers in the West back in those days, which was uh, Kentucky, uh, Ohio, Indiana, were upset with the government out East because of taxes applied to uh, whiskey because it was easier to transport corn in liquid form uh-huh. uh, because it stays usable fresh longer oh, than, yeah. than as grain corn molds pretty quickly if it's not very dry yeah. and stuff tough to do on a river it, yeah yeah and without you know dryers and blowers like yeah. uh, farmers have today no you no couldn't... i'm saying if you put it on the the flat boat dry right it likely won't stay dry true but it might it, well that's true but it but it might mildew even before you get it to the barge yeah, so true. uh anyway yeah for farmers out west and the bulk of the popula- population still lived east of the uh, Appalachians, you know, Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, uh, mm-hmm. Boston, but, um, you know, uh, Charleston, uh, Savannah. But um, it was it was difficult to get the corn across the mountains. It was easier to go down the river, down to New Orleans, and then ship it around that way. But it didn't stay fresh uh, unless you put it in liquid form in a barrel. <laughs> But the government out east was taxing them to death. And that's why the the, yeah. the, the Whiskey Rebellion. Exactly. In the, in the 17- I was going to say that's exactly what that was. What was that, 1780s? Uh, yeah, I sounds think it was. right. I'd have to look it up. Yeah. Me... Again, another ancestor of mine, Nicholas Ruxton <laughs> Moore, who was my great, 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 great uncle, um, was a uh, cavalry cavalry guy. And well, bottom a, line is, a without, out to 1791. Okay, yeah. Bottom line is, if Derek didn't exist... <laughs> the nation would not exist. In fact, you'd have to invent him. Oh. My ancestors were part of the Plymouth colony, and uh, there was another one, James, uh, the, the Jamestown? Jamestown. Yes, mm. they were involved in both of those. No, mine didn't I've been get here, that early. And I had some that were on the shore, ready to meet them <laughs> when they landed. <laughs> so I'm on. Yeah, I've been here for a long time. That's yeah. why I'm so old. And, and between the two of us, we both uh, we we have ancestors who fought on essentially all sides for mm-hmm. control of uh, what is now Great Britain or England. Oh, yeah. I know. Yeah. It's so funny. Welsh, Swedish, English, Scottish, Scottish. Yeah, ish. A little Irish. So, but yeah, between the two of us, it's uh, we're we're going to secede from ourselves <laughs> <laughs> and pay ourselves reparations. Yes. That's the only way to do well, but it. But Sharon's point is, is well taken, that uh, we grew up thinking that the United States has always had 50 states. But within your lifetime, the flag has changed. Yes. So it ain't, it ain't always been so. And we haven't always had 57 states. That's right. <laughs> as Barack Obama famously said. Uh, no, we, when, when, I, when I was born, we had 48. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't long before I was born that those last two were admitted, Alaska and, and Hawaii. But uh, it will not always be 50 states. I mean, we'd like to think that this is just the ship of state is going to sail on unchanged, unchanging and unchangeable forever. But, you know, the Romans thought that too back in the day. Yeah. And uh, it, it, it didn't happen. And it won't happen here in the United States either. Something is going to happen. And I think yeah. it, it may already be past the tipping point. Um, 
And, you know, I don't want to go too deep into the immigration debate because you start down that road. If you start looking at history and making certain points, you sound like a racist even when you're not. And well, I don't want to there, there do are that, as, there, there, there are other aspects if you want to take a look at us and see how we track with the Roman Empire. I mean, the Roman Empire not only invaded everywhere, but they stayed everywhere that they invaded. And they their right. goal was to have hegemony over in the entire world world right and in fact and they, that's uh, been sort sort of our goal they invented uh, reasons you know we need to go to the war with pontus because pontus is bad and uh, besides i want to get the uh, trade from spices well that's or, exactly yeah. it and yeah. rome was famous for going in and we will fix things up hey look at these great roads look mm-hmm. at the trade routes that we're putting in hey right. new highway self-driving you know chariots oh yeah but uh, by the way you're gonna have to give up all your swords yeah and there will be taxes yes Lots of taxes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and oh, since we can't, we, we don't have enough Romans to actually, you know, man all the, the forts along the border to guard the border. We're going to have to let some of these German barbarians become citizens. <laughs> yeah, that didn't work out for them very well. <laughs> no, at all, did it didn't. It? It, so again, yeah, there are a lot of parallels here. So at, at some point, whether it's in our lifetimes or not, uh, the United States is going to change. And it, the, the thing to remember as Christians is not to get so caught up in that, that that we let that get us off message which is to make disciples of all nations mm-hmm. because when you if we're following Jesus Christ as we should and not getting caught up in uh, you know these people are marching over here and these other people are protesting stupid things over there that's always been that that has happened throughout history yes. that has always been the case well you and we I are just, citizens first and foremost of a kingdom of a theocracy you and i were reading this morning on gilbert house fellowship um it was habakkuk mm-hmm. and he was complaining honestly he was uh, about essentially asking the lord are you just sitting up there watching us go to hell in a handbasket mm-hmm. and not caring because that's how we're perceiving this right you are the god of israel and yet you're just sitting up there and letting the gods of the other you know nations around us just pick us off mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh to god all things are now and, and god's response was essentially sort of like with job <laughs> yeah where you're, were you <laughs> Exactly. Where were you when? Didn't you realize that I'm the one who? <laughs> did you do that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, th- that's the thing. Our, when you our time can create frame, things out of nothing, then you and I can talk. Yeah. Yeah. Babylon's coming. They're going to be my instrument of judgment against a wicked nation, but then they will fall. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there, there will be a, a reckoning for the Babylonians as well. Exactly. And from our perspective, historically speaking, because we live in within a timeline, it feels like it takes forever. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and even within that, it said, well, you know, they're going to they're going to ask, when is this ever going to happen? Will it ever happen? And we hear that now. Where's the promise of his coming? He's not coming back. Mm-hmm. You know, these these prophecies have been around for millennia. This isn't yeah. going to happen. It will happen because to God, it's all now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, he doesn't make promises that he doesn't keep. Um, something we probably got to talk about here in the last couple of minutes, because this this could reshape the uh, the Middle East or at least kick things to a, a, a up a notch. Um, interesting that over the past year, uh, Donald Trump, who, from the accounts that I've read, has been a lot less of a micromanager when it comes to military affairs than his uh, predecessor was uh, in the Obama administration, like other presidential administrations in the past, you know, like uh, President Johnson having to approve specific bombing targets yeah. for Vietnam every yeah. single day. Yeah. Pre- President Carter. President Carter. Yeah, President Carter went to the, you know, he, he was assigning parking spaces at the White House. Like, please, that's not something the president should be doing. The Obama administration approving specific helicopter unit deployments. That's not his job. That's not his job. The military commanders on the job uh, on the ground should have the freedom to do what they need to do in order to get there to accomplish their goals. And apparently that's what the Trump administration has been doing over the past year. And lo and behold, the Islamic State has pretty much been run out of Syria entirely. Yeah. Now, Russia will say it's mostly us. Well, and of course, the Russians had done a, a just a, a ruthless and efficient job as well in, in running them out. But I think it's not a coincidence that the uh, Trump administration said, OK, look, generals, you guys know what's going on. You guys are the professionals. Do what you need to do. And suddenly, within a year 
the Islamic State is pretty much cleaned out of Syria and Iraq. Uh, now they've popped up again in Libya. They're, they're not dead yet. Okay, you don't kill a movement like this that easily, just like, you know, the Nazis really didn't go away after World War II was over. But there are other issues at play in Syria and Iraq, and that is what happens to the Kurds. The Kurds have been agitating for their own state since before World War I. They came out of World War I, 20 million people without their own state, the largest group, ethnic group in the Middle East. Um, in fact, maybe even the largest ethnic group in the world without its own state. I could be wrong about that, but the Kurds have been fighting for independence for a very, very long time. And two days ago, uh, the Turks, uh, and uh, apparently Erdogan has been trying to warn Russia and the United States that this was going to happen. They sent uh, troops into northern Syria, Afrin province, which is northwest of Aleppo, um, to clean out the Kurds. The Turks believe the Kurds are... Uh, consider the Kurds to be terrorists. The Kurds have held that area for about five years. Yeah, it's been a semi-autonomous region. But the problem here, the complication, is that the Kurds are our allies and have been the most effective fighting force on the ground against the Islamic State. So what happens when you've got the Turks who are using American-made and supplied F-16s to bomb these American-supported, American-armed allies, the Kurds, uh, and Russia wants to be part of it, too. In fact, they uh, uh, one of the representatives spoke with one of the generals. This is according to one of the generals from the Kurds in Afrin, uh, asking them to give the region back temporarily to the Syrians mm-hmm. so that Syria could fight Turkey. Yeah. Now, I'm not sure that's a good idea either. And, of course, the Kurds aren't there. We're not leaving. This is our homeland here. Right, right. This um, is, yeah, this is to them. Again, this is part of Kurdistan. But this is Erdogan's excuse to take over Syria. Mm-hmm. Er, Erdogan wants to reform the Ottoman Empire. Mm-hmm. And, in, in fact, the so-called coup that took place there, a lot of that was to crack down on the Kurds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The uh, Turks have had a long um uh, a, a long and stormy relationship with the Kurds, and um, part of the problem that uh, the Kurd, uh, the Turks have with Syria and the Assad regime is that the uh, uh, the Syrians were giving refuge, basically allowed the uh, Kurds to use Damascus as a home base for a while mm-hmm. until uh, Turkey essentially threatened a war with Syria some years back if they didn't kick the Kurds out. But uh, still, um, the uh, situation for the Turks is this. Neither Russia, uh, because again, they basically said, look, just hand over the province to uh, Assad, let Assad deal with it. Uh, and of course, the United States, we're not going to support Turkey's incursion into Syria because he's attacking our allies, the YPG, the Kurdish militia. So what what I, the, the one issue I have here is that the United States was not invited into Syria. And now that the Islamic State is more or less run out of there, why are our troops still there? Yeah, I told you, when, when, once we go in, we never leave. Right. Um, somebody sent me a note uh, through email the other day and said, well, we have a vested interest in making sure the Levant doesn't fall into the hands of the Turks and the Iranians. Well, uh, look, the Turks are Sunni, the Iranians are Shia. They've got different goals entirely here. Yes. yes, I know we don't want Iran to have a land bridge to the Mediterranean, but that's mainly because we don't want them to run a pipeline that would s- circumvent or and um, uh, you know, make, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, Obviate the need for a a a, a Saudi gas that a, pipeline. That was a good word. Yeah, <laughs> I was trying to think of another one. There. <laughs> Honey, can it was you? It's a good substitute word. Oh, <laughs> no! Look on your face when you wheels got are that turning. Word. Um, so anyway, uh, but but regardless of what our vested interest is, I I, I don't think we have a vested interest in Syria. A, a legitimate national security interest for the American people. Yes, we should defend our ally Israel. But no. short of that, we don't really have a, any business being on the ground in Syria. Turkey wants Syria. Saudi Arabia wants Syria. Yep. Iran would like to have Syria. Mm-hmm. Russia wants Syria. Yeah. And Syria, like Iraq, is made up of a bunch of um, groups that don't like each other much. The reason that the Assad regime is uh, in power there, uh, they are a minority of a minority. Uh, the uh, Alawites are a subsect of of Shia Islam. Yes. And most Shiites think they're somewhat heretic, but not quite as heretic as the Sunnis. But if the Alawites hadn't banded together with the Druze and the Christians in Syria and then brutally put down the Sunnis, the Sunnis would basically have killed them, which is kind of what was going on over in 
Iraq until we took down Saddam Hussein. You know, the Sunnis are a minority over there. Yeah, if this feels like a repeat, keep, that's why. Yeah. Basically, you've got a minority that's managed to uh, uh, grab hold of political power and hang on for dear life. They're hanging on for dear life because they know if they let go, the majority wants to kill them. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of why there was this war going on there after we weakened the strongman. Uh, so anyway, um, yeah, it's 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 a mess there. We don't really have a vested interest there other than protecting Israel. Um, but, uh, you know, Mr. Trump, I, I, Mr. Pre- I, he's, I know you're not listening, but we'll just say this for the record anyway. Please just get our soldiers out of there. There is nothing that. Yes, please bring them home because they have families over here. Exactly. Exactly. Well, before we go, we're going to leave you with this final bit of advice. When you travel, especially if you travel overseas, don't wear everything you own and you would pack in a suitcase on your body. Because Ryan Carney Williams tried to do that and he was hoping that the British Airways baggage limit would be, you know, sort of ignored Mm -hmm. when he didn't check a bag, but appeared to be much larger and bloated than one with a, a normal-sized head would appear, he was wearing all of his clothes. How many sets of shirts and pants? It was like seven of each. It was the craziest <laughs> thing. And he says that he was targeted because he was young, white. Sorry, if he'd been young and white and a male, or even a young white female, I would have been treated differently. I don't think so. No, I'm thinking that even if you're a dachshund going through that line and you've got on seven pants, <laughs> Sam says, I wear no pants, just so you know. Yeah. I Scan me all you want. I have nothing to hide. Me. Exactly. My weapon is right here beneath it's, my snout. I, I do, here's, he's a fashion designer. He was traveling, you know, outside of England, apparently had enough money to fly on British Airways, to fly to these other countries. Why on earth was he trying to save 50 bucks <laughs> on checked baggage? Uh, I think he wanted this to happen because he did it twice. Oh, he only got twice. caught the second time. I see. I see. Well, you know, that might be. Or, or maybe he was um, doing this for a television show to see if he could sneak <laughs> it onto the plane. Well, you have a fake bomb under all of those clothes? Yes. Well, I'm not going there. Explosive fabric. <laughs> <laughs> and it's self-driving, too. <laughs> the Internet of Things. The Internet of Stupid Things. The Internet of Stupid Things. Oh. Oh, okay, we're going to have to save that. That'll be a show title at some point this year. <laughs> Internet of Stupid Things. Well, uh, March 22nd through the 25th, join us in Dallas if you can. And if you can't, make sure you're watching via uh, the video stream that will be available from Here the Watchmen. The conference features some great speakers. Bill Salas joining us this time. Mm-hmm. Um, but Henry besides, Groover is going to be there. Henry Groover, um, Carl, Carl Gallops, Gallops, L.A. Marzulli, mm-hmm. uh, Josh Peck. But go anyway. Uh, Christine Chris is going to be there, so, yeah. so go for her. And uh, 20% off the uh, video stream or $20 off registration to attend if you use the promo code Gilbert20. That's Gilbert20. The website to sign up is hearthewatchman.com. And don't delay on those tickets for the uh, True Legends Conference coming in September. They will sell out in a matter of weeks. Yeah. Seriously, you may think September's a long way off, but they will sell out. And there are only 3,000 spots in that. The fire marshals will not allow right. the organizers to have more than 3,000. So get get your tickets now. And if you plan on join, joining us either in Dallas or in Branson, Missouri in September, Dallas being March 21st, I think, 22nd. March 22nd through the 25th. Please bring a suitcase. Yes, don't. Don't wear all of your clothes. That's right. <laughs> Security will stop you at the door. And don't put fake bombs in your suitcase. Words Wisdom to live by. <laughs> Wisdom from PID Radio. Until next time, I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you for listening. PID Radio is a production of Gilbert House Ministries. The opening theme is adapted from The Alchemist's Tower by Kevin McLeod, www.incompetech.com. The closing theme is New Day Coming by Steve Grace, stevegrace.com. Our website is PIDradio.com, where you'll find the show notes, links to our personal websites, our books, our weekly Bible study, the Gilbert House Fellowship, and links to connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. 
The content of this program is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution No Derivatives 4.0 International License. For more information, see creativecommons.org. Gonna step up to the microphone Say it loud and clear A better day is coming soon To get us out of here 